Hey, everybody. It's so great to be here with you. And I feel like I've learned already so much today, learned about philosophy and some of the tools we can take from philosophy to improve our working lives and how we can burn down management debt. And so good to be in person again. Thank you all for coming out. I'm Jai Chakrabarty. I grew out my hair during the pandemic. Um, whatever you did, we'll love to hear about that later. And I lead our infrastructure organization at Spotify, and I'm going to be talking to you about the pitfalls and challenges of driving complicated technical migrations. And some of what we've learned at Spotify over the years as we have stumbled our way through it. So, Firstly, I'm going to ask some questions that may inspire some degree of horror. Don't worry. I think we're all in the same boat. So how many of you all today have servers running on an end-of-life operating system? Okay, I see, I see a few hands. Uh, or how many of you have code running on my favorite Python version, Python 2? <laughs> Python 2 was as good as it got, right? Okay. Um, and then are using a framework library or service that's best suited for a museum, right? Um, or, OK, my favorite. How many of you discovered you were using one of these ancient libraries or frameworks during the last Log4j incident? If you don't raise your hand, I don't think I will believe you at this point. Um, and so for folks who may not be aware, the recent Log4j incident, security vulnerability, Log4j used everywhere, right? So we all probably had to deal with this in some capacity, which is to say we're all in the same boat. Some of us may be in a yacht. <laughs> some of it, us may be in a schooner, but probably all in a similar sized boat. All right, so there's no perfect answer for this, but we're going to talk about some of the complexities of dealing with these kinds of migrations. Uh, and I'm going to posit that many, if not most, engineers learned about migrations the hard way. At least that was the case for myself. So I started out as a software engineer, and my first job was working at a production trading company. So we traded stocks, no stress, it was all great. <laughs> and they gave me this seemingly very simple job of upgrading a library. And won't you know, it happened to be a logging library. I thought, this is so easy. I can't believe I'm getting paid for this. And turns out, after I upgrade that library from version X to version Y, all heck breaks loose. And it is that quadrant of chaos that we're in from earlier. And what I've learned is that that library unintentionally brings in a host of other dependencies that I simply didn't know about. Those new dependencies are not compatible with the software that's actually running in production. So from that experience, I started thinking about this larger question. OK, we're in these complex environments. Our environments are becoming more and more complex as we go on day by day. And how in the world do we rein in, and how do we manage this complexity? Because infrastructure is the road that we're all walking on. And if that road is cracked, then we're not going to be able to run very quickly. So I'm also going to claim that infrastructure migrations, in particular, are the most complex to manage. Now, I've been using this word migration. There's pictures of birds migrating. But what in the world is a migration, OK? So uh, a migration is any time you have a system transitioning, Anytime you have a team or is transitioning from one system to another, it could be they're moving from a coding language to another coding language, a framework to another. Anytime you're doing an activity like that that introduces risk, I'll call that a migration. Now, you could have non-infrastructure related migrations. You could be moving from a legacy payments infrastructure to a more modern one. And that's obviously super important. But I'm not going to be focusing so much on those in this talk. I'm going to be talking more about the level 
of infrastructure, which infrastructure broadly defined is this foundation that we're all operating on. It might be the OS, it might be a framework, it might be a set of databases, it might be protocols like gRPC, it might be orchestration systems like Kubernetes. Basically, all the stuff that you need to write the feature without the code that's actually writing the feature as an infrastructure migration. And the reason why these things are so complex is because they touch the whole entire network or many parts of the network. So anytime you make a change to it, even if it's a minor change, there's the possibility that it can be catastrophic, right? Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the approaches and the learnings that we developed at Spotify for thinking about this problem, and hopefully they'll be relevant and applicable to you. But first, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our engineering organization, because all of this is contextualized within culture. And culture and tech debt are absolutely intertwined. The other part of this talk is very much about tech debt, as you'll, as you'll see. Uh, but firstly, you know, our mission there is to connect creatives with billions of fans all around the world. We're a globally distributed organization. We have about 600 engineering teams. And whether you have 600 or whether you have six, I'm going to claim here that anytime you need to do an upgrade, it's going to be usually a big deal because it's a big deal in your context, whether that, whatever that context is. And at Spotify, we also have a platform division. So the goal of the platform division is to accelerate the productivity and safety of all of the engineering teams at Spotify. I'm part of the platform division. Uh, so we also maintain a tech radar and a set of golden paths. So if you are a mobile engineer, a data engineer, backend engineer, if you onboard, you have a set of blessed paths that you can follow that help you get going so you don't stray from what we consider to be a good road to follow. Um, and finally, what's relevant for us here is that we have a ops and squad model so we don't have a centralized or single SRE team, a site reliability engineering team, or a single DevOps team. Instead, it's the responsibility of every engineering team to maintain their own operations, to triage their own incidents with support from the platform division. The reason that's relevant here is when we talk about infrastructure upgrades, while we are going to try and do as much work as we can, ultimately the ownership is going to fall on every single one of these engineering teams. And finally, we strive for aligned autonomy. And what does that mean? So autonomy is the freedom to experiment, the freedom to figure out where you want to go, to have the control to think about and then shape your own destiny. And alignment within autonomy is to also have clarity around the vision, around the North Star. So to provide not only the direction of where the business is going, but also direction around where we're going as a technology organization. So we have a lot of tech. This is actually a picture of our tech radar uh, that we have. And you can see in the central quadrant here, all the green is stuff that is approved for use. So we have a technical architecture group that uh, helps us figure out what goes into these different concentric circles here. And despite the fact that we try to limit the scope of the number of engineering technologies we have, uh, we still ended up owning quite a lot of things. So across all the engineering disciplines, we have 10 different languages that are approved for use. We have 18 different frameworks. And to give you an idea of what a framework is, uh, you might think about something like Spring Boot, for example. We have a bunch of design techniques that are like ADRs, uh, infrastructure components like Kubernetes there. And then there's all of these things that are in trial state. And we're constantly experimenting and thinking about what else to bring into this technical radar here. 
And we have a lot of these platform teams who also are maintaining and building their own technology, which is to say that they're pushing change constantly throughout the organization. So we have now two kinds of change drivers. We have external change drivers. So this is, for example, the log4j incident, stop the world, fix it. And then we have internal change drivers where we ourselves are trying to improve our technology and how do we roll that out across a broad scope of teams. So I'm going to tell you a little story right now about a hypothetical team, and let's see if it resonates. So this is a team that um, I'm going to just call Jukebox because, you know, of course, Spotify. And uh, the, one of the things about Spotify is that almost every name that you can think of is taken by an existing team at Spotify. So I just want to apologize here if there is a team at Spotify by the name of Jukebox. This is not referring to you. Um, but this is a team that really begins in startup mode, right? So they have a great idea, and they're running some A-B tests. And let's say that they start out using these golden paths that I referred to. So they've got a good foundation, but they're not worrying a lot about technical debt. And as we heard about earlier in that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, technical debt, especially for a startup team, isn't going to be that important. And that's cool. That's OK. Because we don't know if this idea is going to be worthwhile for us to pursue. But good news. It turns out this idea is worthwhile, at least the A-B test that we've run come back as being successful. So now we're moving from the startup phase into the scale-up phase. And so in the scale-up phase, we need to make sure this not only works for a small population of users, but that it's going to work across maybe millions of users across the world, that our systems are competent enough to be able to scale and meet those reliability and user challenges. But here's the thing. This team jukebox, they're facing a lot of pressure. There's a lot of excitement. And at this point, the shortcuts that they were starting to use in the startup phase, they're continuing on with those shortcuts. And they're not really devoting the time toward considering technical excellence. Uh, because there's just so many other requests coming in. Now, the third phase, well, it's also good news in some ways, which is that the feature that we developed, or the product that we developed, is a money maker. So we call this the maintain and grow, or the optimize phase. So then what started as an A-B test, we've proved it works, and it's going to become a key part of our business. But the problem is that with Jukebox, they didn't really take the time to think about infrastructure maintenance or the overall quality of the technical health of their systems. Now, they're s challenged with growing further and with bringing in more revenue. Maybe they need to split off and work on building some new features. And it's just a lot to take in. So, at Spotify, we certainly experienced a version of this problem, right? So the stages that I described here, this startup phase followed by the scale up, followed by the maintain and grow phase, you know, I see that constantly. I see teams going through those phases over and over again. I think it's very normal. But the question is, what do we do in those phases, and how intentional are we about tracking ourselves as we're going from one to another and having clear plans of pursuing technical excellence or not, but just having a clear idea of what we're going to be doing in those different phases? And I'm guessing in your respective organizations, you've seen a version of this story as well. Um, and here we come, and this is about four years ago, as an infrastructure organization. Now, how many of you in your teams have gotten an email with something like the subject, 
call to action, need to update, something of that nature, right? Okay, so we were really good at sending those emails. <laughs> Uh, we sent a lot of those emails. We said, hey, please update this. We noticed that you are running on an older version of something. We noticed that this could cause you issues, reliability, security, et cetera. And what we found is that approach of emailing a bunch of teams was just not that effective uh, because it could be that they're simply too busy it could be the case of Jukebox, right, where they're dealing with all of these new business requirements and they simply don't have time. Or it could be that they don't have the context to actually make the update themselves. Or it could be that, uh, you know, they simply have chosen not to prioritize it. So there's a whole host of reasons, but we found that this system of trying to do migrations through email callouts, not effective. And the solutions that we came to, which is why I think this is a relevant talk for engineering managers, is because I think that the solution covers all three dimensions of engineering leadership, so people, technology, and process. So firstly, from a people perspective, is that we need to have some level ups for our engineering managers and for our engineers to be able to consciously prioritize technical health within the different stages as they're growing. So not only starting off in a golden path, but also to take inventory and to have those coherent practices as they evolve into different versions of, of their team. And one of the hypotheses that we developed at this point is that the migration complexities, whether it's this log4j migration or something else, is going to be proportional to the accumulated tech debt of the organization. So if you are an organization that has high technical debt, the migration complexity in your organization is going to be that much higher. So how do you counteract this from a people perspective, right? So really starting to build in the processes to uh, to give your engineers the space to think about technical excellence. And I've been talking a lot about tech debt, but what do I mean by it? Well, so there's this definition that Martin Fowler has where he talks about it as cruft. So cruft is the additional complexity that a system has beyond sort of the necessary baseline complexity. And another way to think about this is if you're running up a mountain and you pack a backpack, what are the things that you really did need to put in the backpack and that you're regretting as you're getting sort of halfway up the mountain, right? So that's kind of technical debt. And it's important as you're thinking about technical debt to begin with an inventory and to really classify what systems your team owns and then to define in your own way what are the standards for quality? And these are gonna be different from organization to organization. There isn't, in my view, a single uniform definition of quality. It's gonna depend on your business, on your rate of velocity that you're aiming for. But it might include things like code coverage. It might include the dependencies within the code. It might include the different processes that you have to deploy code, CI, CD, and the level of automation you have in those deployment processes. So there's no one size fits all here, but it's important for each organization to be able to define their own North Star. And the way I think about all of this is to instill as a cultural value this idea that you try to leave the room a little bit better than you found it. Now the other dimension to this is thinking about process. Now, when we started rolling out these emails, call to action, et cetera, we had a bunch of teams sending call to action emails. So not only was there one migration that needed to happen, there were many. And so part of the confusion was, 
not knowing what to prioritize, what was important. And so this is very nuts and bolts here, but the first thing that we did was we set up a single source of truth to prioritize what was important. We created what we, what we call a migration map, which is a single page in our developer portal backstage where any engineer can go and figure out what's important and when is it due. Now, the other aspect to this is we started to think about every migration as a product opportunity. So for those of you who have product backgrounds here, what I'm going to say next probably isn't going to be earth shattering. But what I found is in infrastructure platform organizations, there sometimes is a lack of product thinking. And what we found is when we started to bring in those same principles, we could start to understand our customers, in this case, engineers, and accelerate what they needed. So here are a few questions to think about uh, when you're asking yourself, have you effectively productified a migration? So have you alpha and beta tested the change with a small group of users? So going back to my example, my first job, well, I sure hadn't done that, uh, or I would have known about the impending chaos. Do your users need more training to adopt this technology? If this is a minor patch upgrade, this is irrelevant. But if you're moving from, let's say, one database to another, then probably is going to be more important there. The third one is very close to my heart, which is, have you led with value? So do the people in your organization know why this migration matters, why it's important? Is it serving a security need? Is it serving a productivity need? So at Spotify, we believe in driving with carrots over sticks. So this idea of value is really important. And then do you understand your user segment? So among our 600 engineering teams, I can tell you they are not uniform. They have different needs. And here, when we're talking about having a product manager defining a go-to-market plan, they're going to do an analysis to figure out what are the team segments, what are these different segments missing, and how can we explicitly tackle those needs? Do you understand who your stakeholders are and what their top priorities might be? And finally, do you have the right incentives in place to reach 100% adoption? And now I'm going to emphasize 100% here, because there is a very, very large graveyard of migrations that have been begun in the technology industry that have gotten to 90% complete, 95% complete, 99% complete. Those are all problematic, right? Because that remaining 1% or whatever, that's what's going to come back and bite us. So how are you going to handle the long tail? What are the incentives for, those, for that last group of teams who are running on the terrible monolith that they don't want to maintain anymore? What are the incentives for those teams to help you get to 100%? Now, at Spotify, uh, we have in backstage, we have some leaderboards and we use a little bit of gamification to get things going. But once you get into the long tail, it's beyond gamification. You need more targeted approaches to help and work with those last tranche of teams. Um, finally, I'm going to talk about technology and uh, this is maybe, you know, the cool Shangri-La part of the talk, but I think everything that came before it is um, as, if not more, foundational. And so this is the idea that we can get rid of the pain of migrations by largely automating our way out of it. So here's how we thought about it. And we have a program that we call Autotune which is composed of really three parts. The first is around test certification. So we have a set of testing standards, and each team can either automatically be certified or go through a manual process looking at their systems to figure out 
if, they are, if their systems are ready and battle-hardened for production. Now, the reason is this is important is because we cannot automate a migration. In other words, we cannot automatically deploy a change to production if it is not well-tested. Right? So this program allows us to ensure that the right level of testing safety is in place before we go about automating things on people. The second dimension is beyond testing and what we call golden state. So these are a set of best practices that allow engineering teams to visualize whether their systems can scale, whether their systems are reliable. And I'm also the sponsor of our climate program at Spotify, and this, is, this one is personally very important to me, whether they are efficient in terms of emissions or just simply waste. So all of that gets bundled into Golden State, and that's an opportunity for engineers who are looking at their state and backstage to understand where they are and sort of have a level up around that. And finally, if all of these aspects are true, then we get into a suite of what we call fleet management tooling, which is tooling that we've developed to automate migrations such as the log4j1 across the entire fleet. But we're only able to do this for systems that adhere to test certification and that are on the golden state. So going back to incentives, this is the circle of incentives, right? These are the promises and constraints that we're involved in. So we, as a platform organization, promise that we're gonna take away the pain of some of these migrations, but there are these constraints, which is we need a high degree of testability, and we need to understand the frameworks that are being utilized here. And finally, I can't say enough about visualization. So this is just a snapshot of one team at Spotify and their Golden State and testing certification dashboards. This is an opportunity for them to understand where they are. Visualization changes everything. It's the way in which teams understand where they need to optimize for and what is still lagging. So just, as a, take just a few takeaways here. Migration complexity is going to increase significantly for teams who haven't committed to regularly evaluating their level of technical excellence, who haven't thought about creating inventories of what they own and having standards for quality and going back and looking at those standards for quality. It's going to decrease significantly when infrastructure teams such as the one that I'm in can think about migrations as product rollouts, using the same principles we use to drive end user product changes. And it's gonna also decrease significantly when teams can visualize their technical state using dashboards such as the one that I, uh, that I showed here, but also beyond visualization, having clarity around what the standards are and seeing where you're potentially falling short. And lastly, it's gonna, of course, decrease significantly when these upgrades can be automated through some of the tooling that I described, the fleet management tooling that we have and other organizations have also developed. Uh, but that tooling is only possible if you have all of the other foundational pieces in place. If you have a culture that supports technical excellence, strong testing coverage, and the ability for teams to think about their architecture and their gaps to getting to a golden state. And with that, I wish you well as you migrate in the future, and I hope uh, no one here is dealing with any further log4j incidents. Thank you so much.